Uh, thanks again for joining uh, the IPPN session today. Uh, my name is Baba Tunde Abidoye. I'm a Global Policy Advisor here in UNDP. And I'm happy to you know, moderate this session today with a lot of our colleagues uh, across the UN. Uh, this session of the IPPN uh, marks the second year anniversary that we've been of the IPPN. Uh, it's uh, something that was launched with 10 co-founding UN entities and uh, you know, a lot of our partners today will be talking, including uh, UNFPA, UNICEF, uh, FAO, ILO, right, as a, as a, that is jointly managing this. Uh, over the past couple of years, the uh, IPPN has witnessed a lot of growth, right, as uh, and we'll show, I think you can go to the next slide on the, on the numbers. And uh, the significant effort to try and put together um, different knowledge uh, products that can help us understand integrated approaches to uh, development, right? Uh, in the short two years, uh, it has grown to 37 UN entities uh, that is represented in its membership and uh, nearly 500 practitioners. And here you can see the, some of the statistics that we have on the 9,000 active emails uh, that are, that gets, uh, that subscribe to the IPPN and then you have more than 7,000 uh, total page views and 58% uh, female speakers. Um, the, the course that was launched two months ago um, has already uh, reached nearly 1,200 uh, registrants also, right? um, showing great appetite in the development community um, for thinking through integrated approaches to, to development. And uh, if you've not done uh, signed up for the training yet, uh, please do, and I know uh, colleagues will put a link in the chat uh, if needed. Um, today's session uh, departs a little bit from the typical uh, IPPN uh, Knowledge Cafe, um, so where we want to be able to review uh, progress achieved uh, by some of the major initiatives in the UN development systems. Uh, we just finished the SG Summit in September, where a lot of us were engaged in different ways. Um, there were 12 high impact initiatives, for instance, um, and uh, many of them, and um, you'll hear a little bit about some of them today. There are others like data and energy and the rest uh, that uh, there's a lot of work also going on. And uh, uh, part of it will be uh, to hear a little bit about more about those different initiatives and also hear from our colleagues uh, that are working on a lot of this from the ground. Uh, the flagship reports like the GSDR uh, right, uh, and the SG Summit, as I said, are calling for policy integration right, as a key element of uh, measures to rescue the SDGs. Um, so what can we expect in the next uh, in the next year or so? So that's a big part of why we're here today. Um, we have uh, a lot of, uh, we have excellent, next slide, Jessica. I think I've gone through some of this. We have a big resource library uh, with 159 curated resources. Nadine and uh, Serge has done an excellent work in trying to put all of that together with contributions from many of, the, of you that are here. And uh, these are policy papers, country analysis, uh, research and uh, training and rest. I'm sorry. To try and interact with those uh, information that are put there. And it's great to see here the resource transfers few region, right? You see 11% from Africa, Europe, Asia, and the rest. Um, where, um, this contributes and uh, share some of these other resources that you might have uh, to, to, to add it to that space. Okay. Um, joining us today, we have um, a number of panelists. Um, and we have uh, Jean-Francois, uh, that is the Senior Administrator Employment Policy Department from ILO. Uh, we have Don Minot, uh, from advisor from uh, Gender-Based Violence and Humanitarian Development, he's next to us at the UNFPA. Uh, Ned and Nena Driver, uh, that is Head of Programs at UN Joint SDG Fund. Uh, Astra Bonini, uh, that is the Chief Integrated Policy Analysis Branch, Division for Sustainable Development Goals at UN DESER. Uh, Jose Valls, Bedo, uh, that is a Policy Officer at FAO. And then San Roy uh, Sishon, uh, that is a Director from Ministry of Finance in Mauritius. Um, 
And these colleagues will be telling us a lot about the 2030 agenda in the UN systems and help us untangle these questions. Uh, and uh, I'd like to welcome them. Uh, I think we can put down the slide now um, and be able to have a conversation. Uh, one of the questions I'd like to put to the panelists is that I'd, so at the 2030 agenda, right, uh, midpoint that we are now, uh, how much progress have we achieved on integrated policy approaches uh, in the UN development systems? Uh, how do your flagship initiatives translate into concrete results, uh, bringing the agencies together for joint work uh, to address complex uh, challenges? Uh, so over to you, uh, Jean-Francois. Let's start with you. Thank you very much, uh, Babatunde, and uh, hello, colleagues. Um, a pleasure to be uh, to be back here at the uh, IPPN uh, Cafe. I think it's been uh, exactly one year that uh, we uh, we engaged and participated uh, and run this uh, first uh, session on the Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transition. So, I mean, it's, we are delighted really to be here and, and, and be able to um, sort of take stock of, of where we stand, but most importantly, uh, have the discussion around, you know, what we have learned uh, around also policy integration. So, yeah, it's 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 a real pleasure. Um, also, just to say that, you know, perhaps one of the first thing I, I've learned now engaging for the last two years uh, under the Global Accelerator and really, Really working on on policy integration is is uh, is is important sometimes to to remove your your individual agency hat. Um, so I I want to say today that I obviously I work for the ILO, but also I'm representing, uh, especially the the global coordination you know uh, team of the technical support facility, uh, which is constituted of of the ILO, UNDP, UNICEF, FAO, WFP. Uh, and and you and women and 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 that collaboration I think is, is extremely important and and I, I will say I will say more about that. Um, now looking at uh, the you know what happened you know during the the SDG summit and the uh, SDG acceleration day on 17 September and and you know looking a little bit backward of you know what has been achieved uh, so far I just want to highlight a couple of of points. The, the first one is that the, the global accelerator uh, really uh, is getting uh, increasingly you know, more traction. There's been a, a very important you know, political momentum built that uh, we are now trying to further leverage uh, for those who uh, uh, watched or even attended the, uh, the SDG Acceleration Day. I think it was a very important milestone in bringing together uh, the pathfinder countries, the uh, the development uh, partners, communities, some of IFIs and, and other uh, key stakeholders. We had uh, excellent, you know, high level uh, also representation uh, with a with a head of state from from Malawi and and several uh, ministers. And 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 looking backward, I think this was a little bit, you know, the culmination of of all what has happened over uh, this uh, first year of of uh, operationalization. Of the of the global accelerator, and we we, we really want to uh, further build uh, uh, on on that on that momentum. There is a, there's been a series of also high level events uh, starting, of course, in in 2022 with the General Assembly, and and over uh, all 2023, uh, also during the ECOSOC, uh, doing important thematic uh, uh, global meeting also on, on adaptive social protection in Berlin or during the Financing Common Summit. So basically all these, all these high level events have really helped us also to uh, move the needle also at country level. And we've seen uh, increasingly also uh, country engagement uh, and a uh, high level commitment as as you recall the global accelerator very much works on uh, securing this uh, commitment either for head of, from head of government or, or head of state and i think when we speak about policy integration which is also about you know bringing uh, bringing the government together uh, trying to break the silos and and enhance uh, coordination not only among the un agencies but also across uh, national actors uh, and these high-level commitments very much help us in uh, in achieving that. 
Now, just a couple, I know I only have three minutes, but I'm, 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 I'm conscious of time, but just a couple of, of key takeaways now in terms of, of, of the sort of, of results and you know how this materialize in terms of not only UN work, but also work uh, uh, at, at, at national level. I think the one of the key observations is, is this kind of push and pull approach, I, I would say. Um, the, the, the global accelerator strategy has been developed, you know, by uh, more than 15 uh, agencies, you know, uh, uh, over 2022, and that has allowed to, you know, develop this common vision of, of what needs to be done, uh, the linkages uh, between, you know, combined investment in employment, social protection for just transition, but also the important linkages to, to the financing uh, aspects, and I think that has very much contributed to cementing a common vision you know, across the UN. And th this is really the foundational aspect, I would say, of, of working together. Now, the the commitment, the high level commitment uh, at, at at country level is really the is really the also the 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 pull factor in the sense that um, because the global accelerator resonates very much with national policy priorities when it comes to, for instance, uh, addressing formalization. Uh, or uh, addressing uh, energy energy transitions and, and, and green and environmental transitions, um, the fact that the, the 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 initiative is led by government at high level and bring together several ministries somehow very much help also the the UN you know to to get their acts together and work collaboratively around you know supporting. A government in the development of of the national roadmap. So, basically, the the national roadmaps are, and that's also another key takeaway. Really, have this potential to, if you want, cement you know collaboration across uh, government entities. And we've seen, for instance, a lot of uh, um, leadership, you know, from ministries of finance together with ministry of labor and and planning uh, in countries like uh, Cambodia. Uh, Malawi, or in case of Indonesia, Ministry of Planning, but on behalf of the government. So really uh, breaking these uh, these silos, and, and that's really what we've been pushing, and I think we've been quite successful in doing that. But at the same time, making sure that uh, this process is supported by the UN uh, system as a whole uh, at, at, uh, at country level. So I think these, 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 two, these two level, if you want, of, of, uh, of, of, of tractions are super important in creating this, I would say, enabling environment uh, for uh, policy integration. If you allow me for just one, 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 last, one last issue on the key takeaway. So two, two, two main things. At operational level, uh, when we talk about UN coordination, uh, extremely high transaction costs and extremely heavy lifting, as you can imagine, um, you know, from the global to the regional to the country level. And that's some, something we need to become still better at, but uh, we see more and more of, 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 of engagement. And importantly, we see now the global accelerator approach being fully you know, owned by uh, some UN country teams, sometimes even you know, running and moving forward quite quickly without too much of us you know, having to push. So I think that's a, a very important uh, uh, development. Now on the substance, on the policy integration, on the, the multiplier's effect of combined investment in jobs and social protection, I think that's really where we still need you know, to, to progress collectively. We know, you know the what, we know the evidence. We, I mean, we have a lot of, I'm speaking for the ILO, a lot of also evidence from our normative uh, uh, instruments when it comes to uh, the, the transition to, to formality or our 2015, you know, just transition guidelines that you know these combined investments are important. But when it comes to the to the how, obviously, we need to deal both with limited capacity from the gov from some governments uh, and uh, a lot of sometimes uh, I would say uh, technical support that needs to be further uh, exerted as we you know as we shape uh, these strategies at at national level. To that, we, we also need to, of course, add the financing dimensions, and and as we see, also bringing the conversation on the policy dimension together with the financing aspects. And just to give you some examples, sometimes we we really need to push to connect the dots, even at UN level, between the colleagues working on on SDG financing and the colleagues working more on, uh, I would say, the the policy more um, substantial policy issues. Um, but a very a lot of very interesting experience to. To share in that regard, uh, and 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 uh, we will make sure so we document those as we move forward. So yeah, I'm I've taken too much time, so over to you. Thanks. 
Thanks, your friend, sir. All right, uh, done. We'll go to the Spotlight Initiative. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Babatunde. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just say it's a pleasure to be here. Um, sadly, it is my first time to the network, but really it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm going to be framing my, my talk with you, um, just kind of highlighting three specific um, uh, issues. One around how we um, leverage the synergies between the SDGs and looking at the spotlight as an example to do that. Um, and I think, you know, really when we think about um, synergies within um, achieving the, the goals that are set for us by 2030, one of the more complex challenges that we as the world is facing is gender inequality and spin-off effects such as um, violence against women and girls. So I'll pay a little bit of attention on that. And then I'll kind of wrap up my interventions with you on what it looks like when we invest in women and girls as a means to ex expedite progress towards sustaining and um, well, maintaining and sustaining the results that we have thus far in achieving the SDGs. So I, you know, when we take a look at the um, the 2023 Global Sustainable Development Report, which you referenced just now, Baba Tunde, um, one of the things that it does do is to highlight the key transformations that are needed in different sectors to accelerate progress towards the SDGs. It also emphasizes two points that I want to flag here as I get started. And one is that it, it talks about the need for interventions that leverage synergies between the SDGs and drive this simultaneous progress across multiple indicators. And it also highlights the effectiveness of such interventions for female and younger populations, which underscores the importance of removing the barriers that these marginalized groups will face or actually are facing. So as one of the core UN agencies that's implementing the Spotlight Initiative, as UNFPA, we know that it's a good case study, and that's why we want to highlight it today in the in discussion with you. But also, it's why it was selected as an SDG High Impact Initiative. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Just as a quick recap, for those who, for any reason, may not be familiar with the Spotlight, which is kind of hard to think, but it was launched in 2017. Um, and it's one of the um, more unique programs in the UN's development system in that it received an unprecedented multi-year dedicated funding, which came to us from the EU at a, a amount of 500 million. And it's really been successful in tackling what, as I said before, is one of the world's most pervasive challenges, which is gender inequality, and specifically on addressing the multiple forms of gender-based violence. And one of the values of the spotlight is that integrated model that is put together in terms of how to respond to gender-based violence in a more comprehensive and integrated way. Um, in terms of UN coordination, which I think this, this question is also asking us to look at, um, the spotlight operates under the resident coordinator system at the country level, and it's being implemented as a delivering as one model for multiple UN agencies, of which UNFPA is one, and it's aligned to the Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework as well. And one of the, I think, the unique strength of Spotlight is that it, it really, as I said before, it's holistic, it has a coordinated approach, but it works by leveraging the mandates and the, the global reach and technical expertise of the various UN agencies to address this interconnected cause of violence against women and girls. And as you would have seen in my bio, the core part of my work here in UNFPA is around looking at how we better work across the humanitarian development peace nexus. So the spotlight, by virtue of the way that it is designed, actually lends itself well to work across these three different interventions um, for a more complementary and integrated way of working. So for UNFPA, um, the initiative is being implemented as part of our wider ecosystem of um, GBV programs. And I say that because we have over 400 programs that address violence against women and girls, both in terms of prevention and response in over 153 countries. And so this Spotlight Initiative is helping us to contribute to one of our transformative goal that we've set for ourselves along with partners to achieve by 2030, which is to end gender-based violence. It can end and we're working towards ending that and also harmful practices as well. So from our efforts at the country and regional level, I'd just like to give you a snapshot of some of the successes that we've seen working through the spotlight with our other um, GBV programs. One is that we're able to generate and use and analyze 
gender-based violence prevalence and administrative data. We've also seen an increase in access to quality multi-sectoral services and um, a better use of the integrated approach whereby we can provide sexual and reproductive health services and promote specialized services with a focus on women and girls as survivors of gender-based violence and also those who are most at risk of that form of violence. And expanding beyond UNFPA to look at the wider UN family in over 30 countries and across regions, um, I'll just flag three of the key achievements that the spotlight has achieved. One is that we've seen an eightfold increase in national budgets addressing violence against women and girls. Over 1.6 million women and girls have received gender-based violence services. And in terms of young people, 2.5 million have participated in programs that promote gender equitable norms. And these are um, results that are well um, researched and, um, and, and reported. And we're just really you know, looking at how effective this model has been in achieving these results. And one of the studies that we've done is one that was led by Dahlberg in 2021. And what it actually shows is that the effectiveness of this model with that more integrated approach um, reveals that at least 70 to 90 percent um, a greater impact in reducing violence as a, as comp uh, compared to programs that have a more siloed model in, in their approach. So what the initiative shows is that when we invest in women and girls, it is highly effective. So with the EU investment, multi-year dedicated funding and a significant amount the synergies that the SDG report is calling on, we see this coming through the Spotlight Initiative as well, such as addressing violence against women and girls, which we know is a target under goal five. But when you look at the synergies, the results that we're seeing is contributing to goal one in terms of alleviating poverty. It is contributing to goal three on enhancing health promoting education, which is goal four, empowering women um, economically, goal eight, and also fostering inclusive societies, which is linked to goal 16. So we see those synergies already coming through with the results that we've gotten from the spotlight. But sadly, though, though this is proven to be an effective tool, I think um, what we can do um, better is to better utilize this um, integrated model of responding to gender inequality. So the initiative is now transitioning to its second phase. And um, in order for us to sustain and to build on the, the, the results that we've now um, seen, vigorous funding is crucial. And this is an impress it's impressive because currently less than 0.2%, and I'm, I'm gonna read this quote for you, less than 0.2%, of the US dollar 204 billion in the official development assistance ODA is directed towards preventing violence against women, 0.2% of ODA. So it therefore means that any investments that we as the UN can garner towards ending gender-based violence, towards um, gender equality, will be able to offset this difference in the ODA funding. And my last point here, Baba Tunde, is that the Spotlight Initiative demonstrates that when we invest in women and girls, it's not only a moral imperative, but it's highly effective in advancing not just SDG 5, where this particular initiative sits, but really in advancing the entire agenda for 2030. So I'll start there and pick up some more on the high impact initiative later on. No, thank you very much, Don. And those are very key statistics that you've shared with us. And I like the part of all the goals uh, that that, is, that this contributes to. Um, now we'll go to Jose. Uh, Jose, um, if you can tell us a little bit more about the FO, uh, the food system transformation. Uh, and then I know we're running behind, but uh, it would be good uh, to hear a little bit more from you. So. Over to you, Jose. Can you hear? Jose, can you hear me now? Uh, okay, uh, while you check your mic and uh, maybe we'll go to- uh, Sorry, Ned. can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. I had a no last problem. minute uh, problem. Yeah, over to you, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Babatunde. And uh, it's also a, a great pleasure to be to be here with uh, all of you today and to be part of this, uh, this cafe of, of the network. So thank you for the for the invitation. 
uh, well, I think a lot is uh, is being said already about uh, about uh, how policy integration is addressed. What I wanted to to focus on here is uh, uh, actually on on how the agri food systems and the the food systems agenda can can really and we are seeing that is providing a, an entry point for for promoting integrated uh, policy approaches in the in the system. And uh, we are seeing uh, that from from the FAO perspective, but also in in working across the the whole system and working with with different agencies uh, on 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 these uh, on these issues. So first, uh, just to 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 also remind how agri food systems are really complex systems. They they are made of uh, uh, really complex interactions, relationships between the different activities from food production, processing, storage, distribution uh, to food environments and consumption and, and disposal of food. So looking at all those those range of activities, but also all the uh, stakeholders that are involved in the in the food systems that take decisions and make choices within and across the, the system and together with the interconnected outcomes, which of course include uh, food security and nutrition, but not only. Uh, that is the most obvious one, but then there are also other uh, economic, environmental, and, and social impacts that, in the end, are at the core of the of achieving a, a sustainable uh, uh, the sustainable development. So all these uh, complex interactions and and inter relationships uh, mean also that making a change in the in the agri food system, so uh, an agriculture production practice, for example, or the way food is displayed in 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 retail or the or a, a school meal program will have uh, uh, effects in other parts of the system and also in other interconnected systems like health systems, energy systems, etc. So this is the, the, the challenge we are, we are looking at uh, and, and we need to look at all these outcomes at the same time. And uh, this is where also in, uh, policy integration is, is so crucial uh, in it. We also have a, a very big opportunity in, in that challenge, let's say, uh, because we are seeing that agri-food systems also can provide, or at least fixing the agri-food systems, can provide solutions to some of the major challenges that, that we are facing, like climate change or biodiversity loss. And we have uh, agri-food systems producing one third of the greenhouse gas, gas emissions in the world, for example. So uh, a potential there. Uh, also rural poverty, agri-food systems are one of the biggest employers uh, in, in the world. And uh, uh, almost half of the population uh, depends on agri-food systems for their livelihoods, especially in rural areas. So uh, another potential there. And this, in addition, of course, to food security uh, and malnutrition, with uh, there its secondary effects also on, on productivity, on health, and etc. So just to give an idea of the transformative power that we are seeing in the agri-food uh, systems and, and how uh, this systems approach is, is also so important. This uh, this power, transformative power, and 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 looking at how transforming agri-food systems by shifting the way we produce food, the way we aggregate, the way we distribute, or the way we consume food, uh, are are really uh, can can really have a, a catalytic uh, and and multiplier effect across all the SDGs, and that was recognized in the Global Sustainable Development Report. Uh, uh, and food system is actually one of the entry points uh, uh, for sustainable development, and is now also one of the six key transitions. Uh, to accelerate uh, SDG achievement. Um, so uh, how are we looking at it uh, and, and what are we learning from using this approach uh, uh, from, from FAO side? Of course, in, in, FAO, from, in FAO, we are looking at several of the dimensions that I mentioned uh, that are within the agri-food systems, but we are also looking at how to operationalize the, this food system approach uh, in practice and how to bring it to 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 the policy space and and therefore uh, looking at policy coherence and and then uh, policy integration and what we're what we're seeing there is well first that it's not easy this is the first uh, learning the second learning is that it's possible and uh, and we are uh, working we have been working uh, also recently with with countries with partners on looking at what are the mechanisms that can allow this policy integration in in the in the agri food systems agendas, and one one of the first things is is of course bringing the the relevant stakeholders around the the agri food systems uh, together and and facilitate their engagement. That was done, for example, through the food system summit uh, process, the preparation, but also the follow up to the food system summit uh, at country level, also at uh, global level. 
we need also to have to, to find a, a shared sense of directionality towards the food systems we want. The, the agri-food systems can look very differently, and uh, there is not one uh, better or or there is not one only one solution to agri-food systems. So. This uh, was also uh, achieved through the food system summit process with the uh, countries getting into developing national pathways, national strategies towards uh, agri-food systems uh, and, and looking at this collective vision and, and have it in, in, a, in, a, in a policy or at least planning document. And then one important uh, aspect also that we are uh, looking at how to uh, support in engaging with trade-offs and, and uh, synergies, because uh, it's, it's very clear that we cannot, uh, we have to move from uh, working as each of us, as, as it was said before, I think, on our own piece of work, our own agency with our own mandate, but really on looking at what are the implications in other pieces of the system or other systems. So uh, we need to, to understand what, what are the, these trade-offs, what are these possible synergies that we can, that we can um, take from the, from the, from the action. Uh, one one other important point is the is the the what I was mentioning before about the context specificity. There is no one size fits all, so we have to to be looking at what uh, in 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 talking about agri food systems. What are the agri food systems we are looking at 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 local level, at uh, global level, uh, but also at at country level, and and they will uh, they will have uh, each their own uh, context. Also regarding time. Uh, we need, and this is what we are, one of the challenges we are facing is how to balance the short-term actions and short-term goals at these different levels with longer-term outcomes, which is uh, what would uh, bring the sustainable development. And then to finalize, one other aspect that we are uh, also working on and that we think is, is very important in, in, in also in, in bringing all these, these pieces together, which is a real challenge, uh, is in creating and, and building spaces for collective learning and for adapting uh, as we go, because there are no blueprints on, on how to get the best policy mix uh, in, in uh, improving the agri-food system. So we really have to open and to, and to facilitate and to animate these spaces for for, for this collective learning about what each stakeholder is doing, each country is doing, and, and then adapt uh, uh, each one of us as, as we go uh, towards this, uh, this more uh, integrated vision to, to have uh, the agri-food systems we want. I would, I would leave it there, and, and maybe in the second round, I can go more uh, in concrete terms in the, in the specific tools and, and entry points where we're seeing in the moving forward. Thanks, uh, Bamatunde. No, thank you very much, Jose, for that. Um, all right, so Ned, uh, we've heard from Don on the less than 0.2% uh, financing that goes from the US to gender based violence. I know you're working a lot on points called to the little bit no one behind and all that. Stuff. So it would be good to hear from you. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Robert Sunde. Um, let me just uh, step a, step back a bit because, as, as, uh, as uh, you know, framed at the very beginning, Robert Sunde, we are at the midpoint. So um, actually, it's a very good timing uh, for the Joint Energy Fund in particular, because almost exactly five years ago, um, the uh, terms of reference of the fund was adopted and the fund was launched we, uh, after a multi-stakeholder um, workshop where we defined the, uh, the theory of change and the, um, the result framework. So in a way, it's also a reflection for us, and we are getting into a new phase uh, with the um, six um, uh, SDG transitions. But just looking back, um, I was involved beyond the you know joint SDG fund. I was involved in um, I conducted the midterm evaluation of maps. I was involved in the predecessor of the joint SDG fund, which was called the Re Delivering Results Together Fund. And I think we um, when we discuss integrated policy or integrated approach, I think we need to um, make a step further in trying to clarify what we actually mean by that. Um, and we've been having I was in the task force on integrated support. We had so many discussions, but um, I believe that. Uh, too often integrated is limited to referring to joint agency work. And this is certainly uh, the uh, DNA of the Joint SDG Fund. Um, we support the SDG acceleration and the uh, beyond development system reform. The, the reform part requires agencies to work together, but the SDG acceleration, the integrated aspect of, of that goes beyond just agencies doing some joint work. Um, I remember there was this whole theory of change of the UN development system, which said, that if we are working more closely together, uh, the governments are going to break down the silos, which I always felt was uh, missing the middle point. We can work together 
but still this does not that does not translate into actually governments applying integrated approaches which means having a coherent outcome in terms of system reform so um when the joint energy fund was uh, established uh, five years ago we started pro programming and in uh, funding allocations uh, a year and a half afterwards um we really looked into the maps and um and we realized that again integrated should mean a lot of different things so let me clarify this because that that actually provides the framework of how do we interpret the results of the joint energy fund midway points to the 2030. it's about joint programs it's about agencies working together certainly and i think we have to make a, a major breakthrough still because uh, joint programs are often limited to agencies uh, jointly designing something and then some coordination and then joint reporting joint implementation is still lacking to, to a larger extent and actually it's very hard sometimes to define even what joint implementation really means but then integration also means the three pillars of the 2030 agenda or sustainable development so social economic and environmental that also means working uh, across multiple SDGs or SDG uh, targets, more specifically, uh, this kind of multi-sectoral approach. And something that is often forgotten is working across the, the timeline and across generations. So all of that has been incorporated into the, the joint SDG fund. Uh, primarily, if you look into the maps, it's not so much the, the map, the M, the M, the mainstreaming, but it's acceleration which requires genuinely integrative or integrated approaches to systemic change, and then also policy support, which means agencies working together. The other thing is that uh, integrated is not new thing uh, to the UN, and certainly not for the beyond the UN. It, it kind of, you know, emerged in the 1950s. They were delivering results together, um, delivering as one uh, countries, uh, and there was a fund that was uh, supporting before this one, which was called Delivering Results Together Fund. So, Putting all that together, when we talk about integrated, the Joint SDG Fund had several years of innovation, applying to every particular portfolio very different way of addressing integrated policy and integrated uh, approaches more broadly. And this actually tells us a bit, you know, we've uh, invested into over 230 joint programs, uh, 119 countries and territories, 31 UN entities were involved overall, and we provided direct impact to over 180 million people. So the lessons learned midway point is that there are probably three main ways to scope integrated approach. The first one, and that refers to our first portfolio on integrated social protection, LNOB, or leaving on behind, is that you can frame it and scope it thematically. The second portfolio that we had was on SDG financing, INFFs and blended finance, uh, where we scoped it methodological. And then the third portfolio was on small island developing states, states where we scoped it geographical. That poses the question of how do we cut the pie? How do we break down the silos? How do we bring sectors and agencies and government authorities and other stakeholders together? Do we uh, focus on thematic issues? We heard from Jean-Francois, from Jose, um, uh, on these kind of things. Do we uh, also, uh, from Don, um, do we uh, scope it methodologically as maps originally uh, anticipated, or do we focus on specific geogra uh, geographical uh, frameworks, whether it sits or maybe we can talk about Sahel, and try to um, apply these integrated approaches in this context? What we learned is that um, the results can be done uh, through integrated approach even within two years. So, um, as I said, 188 million people direct benefit uh, from our support within the first two, two and a half years. But a lot of that is not necessarily intentional design of integrated approach and systemic change. One of the things that is uh, missing is a more substantive systems literacy across the EU and especially uh, in our you know, field offices. When we talk about certain things, people you know, believe their buzzwords. You know, we say, okay, so identify leverage points. And then people, oh, okay, so that's some, you know, HQ language and, uh, you know, God knows what it means. Well, actually, you know, leverage points is it's a whole science or sub-science. And if you don't understand how to identify leverage points, you cannot have leverage. You cannot uh, design uh, interventions that 
apply small um, efforts, relatively small efforts, small funding to create this catalytic boom effect um, and then uh, really create something that we can consider leverage. It's very difficult for, for our colleagues to design these kind of things because again, I believe uh, system literacy is relatively low. Doesn't mean that everyone needs to have a PhD in you know system science, but we need to be um, better able to understand how to design around the most vulnerable LNOB, how to design about uh, changing the pathways to the system and how do we actually use, as, as in our case, roughly $2 million over two years to, to move mountains, to, to leverage hundreds of millions of dollars, to, to impact millions of people. Um, so this has been done. There are many uh, islands of excellence, if you wish, in many countries, uh, which did that. Um, but we are still lacking um, understanding of what theory of change for integrated approach means. Um, we've been struggling with that. So we are incubating also thematic windows around several of the initiatives that uh, Jean-Francois mentioned, Jose mentioned, food systems, uh, global accelerator jobs and um, uh, social protection, digital education. What does it really mean to have a transformative theory of change? And I think we need to do a much better job uh, uh, collectively as the UN development system around that. And when we talk about uh, policy shifts, this is another thing that is considered buzzword. Um, it, it's often not clear what that really means. How do we measure policy shift? What does it mean to actually, you know, engage in transformation versus change? Um, we are now as a joint SDG fund making a kind of inventory of all these lessons learned, all these kind of experimentations at the global and country and region levels. And uh, at this very moment, we are um, under the leadership of the Deputy Secretary General finalizing the new strategy of the joint SDG fund which is based on the outcome of the SDG summit, the six SDG transitions and four engine rooms, which by, by themselves also indicate something that I mentioned earlier, SDG transitions are basically thematic scoping of, of the priorities, whereas the engine room actions are more of a methodological scoping. But the challenge remains, how do we avoid creating silos? You know, sometimes the SDGs are silent. How do we avoid creating silos around transitions? And how do we land all that at the country level where colleagues genuinely work together, so integrated in terms of agencies coming together, but also facilitating government authorities to come back to, uh, to come together, break down the silos and create a coherent outcome, which I believe is the very definition of the integrated support. So I'll stop here, Babatunde, and um, uh, in the next round, I hope uh, to provide more information if colleagues are interested. Uh, thank you very much, Ned, uh, for giving us that big picture. All right, uh, Sanroy Astra, I know you've been patiently waiting. Um, Sanroy, uh, we'd like to hear more from you on the work you're doing in Mauritius. And uh, uh, thank you, over to you. Thank you, Babatunde. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting more strategy to participate in uh, this uh, very uh, insightful discussion. And uh, for us, obviously, we are not a UN agency. And uh, I think this brings us in a very favorable position um, and bring a complementary and alternative angle to this particular discussions going on today. Um, I've heard many speakers talk about the commitment at country levels, the importance of bringing in all ministries and all agencies and to break the silos and start working together. The UN RCO system has brought this change in uh, connecting all UN agencies working together. However, I take the example of Mauritius. You have our different ministries working with different UN agencies, some on agriculture, some on uh, energy, some on gender equality, the Ministry of Finance works on and above items with the UN. However, when, uh, when we look from the perspective of the UN agencies, uh, from on the other side of the table, we don't have necessarily this coordinating mechanism that brings together all the different ministries within a specific country. And this often makes policy integration very difficult. At each ministry level, um, they can have all the best intentions, work out the best strategies, best policies for their particular items or fields of expertise. Um, but often we have seen that they are in conflict with other strategies and policies of other ministries. And there is no arbitrage, arbitrage which is being done by anyone. In some countries, of course, there is a Ministry of Planning, which identifies the main uh, focus areas, the main priorities. 
this kind of scenario modeling. But in Mauritius, it has been uh, nearly 20 years since there was a Ministry of Planning or even an institution look, looking after planning. So earlier this year, uh, it was an idea announced last year, um, the Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning and Development announced the setting up of Mauritius strategy. So I'm going to explain a bit more of what Mauritius strategy is, or wh what we have done so far. We are a relatively young organization, seven months old, and what we plan to do, what we aim to do. So Mauritius strategy has been set up under the Ministry of Finance to contribute to public action through economic research, consultations with stakeholders, and uh, basically act as a platform that will connect ministries, govern uh, ministries, sorry, citizens, and the business world together uh, to discuss and uh, work on together towards a common objective on economic, social, and environmental matters. Since our creation in, a, in March this year, late March this year, we have focused a lot on working with the different development partners in Mauritius, and especially the UN. Now, the UN RCO in Mauritius uh, chairs the development partners meeting. So it's an ideal platform for us to work with the different um, I would say development partners and the different UN agencies that was different aspects and rope in the different ministries and departments of these ministries which are working in specific items. Mauritius is a small island in developing states. Um, our mid, um, I would say trapped between inverted commas in the high upper middle income country trap. So we briefly achieved high income status just before COVID, but then we uh, got pulled back down into it. So we are on the brink of doing something that few countries have done, but this could be at uh, an opportunity cost. The environment, we are seeing rising sea levels, coastal lines, etc. The UN, the Agence Française de Développement, and number of the World Bank, the IMF have been working with the different ministries, but in silos, in an uncoordinated and haphazard manner. So we were brought in the equation to get all these initiatives together and do this arbitrage and identify priorities. So our task now is to start working on a vision for Mauritius, on a long-term vision. And this long-term vision, we are working together with the UN. The UN, of course, is well-established, has a vast network, has their priorities right, has all the expertise and experience. And uh, we believe that they are the best person to guide us throughout this, uh, this project of developing Vision 2050 for Mauritius. But at the same time, the UN needs an interface, a focal point. And I think this is, and we aim to position ourselves as this focal point for Mauritius to bring in all um, the strategies of the different ministries, of the different agencies together and make and allow the government at highest level to make the right choices. So I believe this is, an, this is a model. We are still young. Uh, I'm not saying anything about the success or failure, but it is a model that can be considered and should be brought in in every discussions with every other country, especially developing and least developed economies. This focal point approach from the country side is very important to avoid duplication or even contradicting policies. Um, I might go into specifics into, the, into what we are doing exactly with the UN, but I think it is uh, more appropriate for the next round of questions. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Sanroy. And here, you know, this is practical integration at a national level, right? And um, very interesting work that you're doing. And I see Sir just put a link uh, for, for for it in the chat. All right. Uh, before we go to the next round, I wanted to call Mata um, and uh, and Fabio uh, to be able to tell us a little bit about uh, the intervention and what you've had so far. We want our maybe a minute. So. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you so much, Batunde. So I just wanted to go back to uh, what, uh, so first of all, introducing myself, Marta Kali, I'm from the Development Coordination Office. Uh, so colleagues in the panel referred to the key uh, transitions, the six transitions, and I just wanted to put that a little bit also in context of the, um, the work of the Resident Coordinator System. Uh, last week, actually, we brought together all resident coordinators to reflect uh, on SDG acceleration and respond also to the member states' call for transformation and acceleration made at the SDG summit 
So we do have a uh, shared narrative um, on the so-called um, six transitions, food system, energy access and affordability, digital connectivity, education, job system and social protection, uh, climate change and biodiversity loss and pollution with gender equality and uh, uh, human rights uh, cross-cutting across all the transitions. And, um, and around which I would say, the, the, the UN Development System, the UN Sustainable Development Group is coalescing um, and Ned referred that to the strategy of the Joint SDG Fund as a key element also for um, implementation of this vision. So the transitions are a uh, framework really to reorganize the UN, the, the, the country team offer um, to countries uh, through the system thinking lens and using the integrated approach exactly in the sense that was, I think, very eloquently explained by Ned just now in his intervention. Um, and as we hear these terms, um, I just want to be very clear um, that this is not a new agenda. This is very much uh, about implementing the SDGs. It's not a blueprint because context and national priorities remain key. But I, we see this as an opportunity and it is really an opportunity to um, introduce new thinking uh, on how to realign the development system around a shared global narrative on SDG acceleration, but also a more powerful approach to um, achieve the SDGs uh, through these multiplier um, uh, strategies that really bring and achieve multiple SDGs at once. So this requires working much more coherently to leverage the UN offer, the policy support, the data, the financing mix that colleagues referred to, and the RC, the resident coordinators convening power across uh, all these transformative areas. So the, with the normative lens, of course, of uh, um, the transitions being just, equitable, and reaching the farthest behind. So we really just want to focus on uh, on the actions um, that, again, our colleagues explained across those different initiatives that the system can take, RCs and UNCTs can support countries with, to um, really bring this transformation. So across policy frameworks, uh, across bringing, uh, you know, the helping build this pipeline of investments um, and convening all the relevant actors, bringing the financing mix uh, in and 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 supporting uh, capacity building also at scale for this. So I just wanted to uh, mention this uh, briefly also to contextualize it in the um, in the in the work that the resident coordinators and country teams are focusing on. And um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Fabio, over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm Fabio Loza, the economist in the RC office in Madagascar. And my very brief intervention will focus on how here in Madagascar, we are refocusing the work of the UNCT toward policy coherence and policy integration. As you might know, Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world, regularly exposed and structurally vulnerable to natural and non-natural hazards and to climate change, with almost all the SDGs of track and the very limited financial resources to address all these development challenges. So these should be one of the places where policy coherence and policy integration should be the mantra. But as you know, in many situations, barriers to make actors work together, to integrate instruments and, and, and efforts are often very difficult to overcome, both within the UN system and across the national actors, like for example, the government ministries. So what we did in Madagascar to, to try to change this situation and to put policy coherence and integration at the forefront of the cooperation framework that will start on January 1st, 2024, is to innovately revise the common country analysis. So starting by our main analytical document, so in this effort, acknowledging the complexity and the interconnectedness of today's world and today's sustainable development challenges, 
we conduct with UNCT under what we call the Madagascar Quintets of Change Lab, uh, uh, again, changing CCA and cooperation framework process. This new approach founds on complementing sectoral analysis with the application of system thinking and strategic foresight. So move away from a linear causal effect analysis toward a systemic and forward-looking analytical understanding of sustainable development, situation, and challenges. And when you put on the table causal loop, externalities, and trade-off running across the different dots of the system, then the reflex is really to, to try to connect the dots through consideration of policy coherence and policy integration and coordination. So this, this effort on the CCA led us to a new cooperation framework that integrates strategically the SG cross-cutting accelerators and the six transitions. And it's really creating momentum within the UNCT for joint projects, joint programs, and, and joint work plans. But this is also engaging directly the government of Madagascar because in, at the recent SDG summit, Madagascar committed to policy coherence and policy integration to accelerate the SDGs in the country. And this is really creating opportunities for the UN system to support the government and to accelerate the sustainable development goals. So this was my very brief intervention on how to root uh, policy coherence and policy integration within the standard process of CCA and coordination and cooperation framework by introducing system thinking and strategic from, uh, foresight from the onset. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. And uh, for, for that, Fabio, you're the economist at the RC office, right? In Madagascar, so I didn't introduce that. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. All right, colleagues. Um, Ned, I know you need to go at nine, right? Or are you good? Yeah. Uh, do you want to yeah. quickly come in before Astra? Um, any quick thing you want to say? Or should we move on? Um, sorry, but are you asking me or colleagues? Uh, you. I know you have to go. No, at no, nine. no. I don't want to take more more of okay. the time. And apologies if I need to jump off. I have a hassle. Um, no but um, I really um, appreciate the the that you organized this in previous uh, cafes because because as I said I think one of the major challenges for us is really to increase the capacity of, of colleagues across the board, especially in the field um, on on what do we mean by integrated and because if you don't know what that means and how we should you know go about this we'll not be receiving the results that we expect so very much looking forward to further work of of this uh, this committee thank you so much thank you. All right, Astra, the GSDR report that we all love uh, and that you've led on developing this. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about our report for colleagues that might not be familiar with it, uh, but following the 2023 SG Summit, uh, what are the perspectives and opportunities going forward um, on, on this area in the Palo SG transformation? Over to you, Astra. Thank you so much, Babatunde, and it's really um, nice to see the, the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network continuing to bring colleagues together. Um, certainly, the integrated approach to the SDGs, you know, coming out of the SDG Summit, it was clear once again that this is the crucial way forward. And um, I, I have to say that many of the elements of the GSDR have been brought up in other colleagues' remarks, so it's really nice um, to see that that is is being used, but maybe just for those who aren't familiar with the report, I can quickly um, explain the the origins, which, you know, really it was called for at Rio plus 20, but then um, in 2016, the member states requested that the report be produced every four years in, in advance of the SDG summit, and also that it be written by an independent group of scientists who would be appointed by the secretary general. 
So the, the first report of this nature was produced in 2019. It was produced by um, 15 scientists coming from different regions, different disciplines. It's very multidisciplinary. Um, so from the scientific perspective, it attempts to break down silos and bring together natural scientists, social scientists, um, experts from the humanities and really reach out um, not only within that group of 15, but to scientists and, and experts um, across the world. And the, the intention is to provide an evidence base for policymakers to use when they're making decisions at the SDG summit and beyond, um, really kind of underscoring that uh, strong analysis and evidence are needed to make some of these decisions and to really um, implement this integrated approach. And I think the the um, Nanette brought up the systems thinking capacity and how important it is to have that um, you know strengthened in order to take advantage of of some of this analysis. So the report provides this, and um, in 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 particular, I think the twenty the twenty nineteen report put forward the importance of um, finding systems to use to tap into all of the SDG synergies and also to manage potential trade-offs. And so they identified um, six entry points for transformation where these synergies and, and trade-offs were particularly strong so that um, in some ways it could become a little bit more manageable to tackle the SDGs by looking at these entry points, uh, food systems, energy systems. They're very much uh, aligned with the, the six transitions that are, are being used to organize a lot of the, the UNCT work right now. And um, both really just bringing about these key areas that require action and, and transformation over the next seven years. Um, the 2023 report looked at new analysis, and I, I like that Don um, kind of pointed this out right away, that these interlinkages can vary across groups and across contexts. So one of the, the findings of the latest analysis on interlinkages is that investing in, um, in women and in youth in rural areas can have especially high synergies. And a lot of times these are also groups that are not, that are a bit on the, the more marginalized end of the spectrum. And so there's a, a space uh, to support, you know, the, the call to leave no one behind, but also to really generate some synergies in these areas by looking at particular groups. Um, but the fact that these interlinkages tend to be very context specific also led the report to just to call for more analysis at the country level of how SDG is linked together. Um, you know, if you had a, a country with a very high level of, of informal labor investments in, um, you know, some of the entry points might have a, a different impact than in, in a country with a high um, formal labor force. So just mapping out those interlinkages in the different contexts is really important. And that leads to one of the other messages that um, investing in science R&D, especially in the global south, is really critical so that um, all of the, you know, a large portion of the published papers on climate change, SDGs, are based in a very small number of countries, small number of journals. And so the, the analysis that's available really isn't getting to these issues in all of the different um, places and supporting scientists in different regions. So it's really important to um, invest in R&D in, in across the world to, to ensure that the analysis is available. Um, just one more uh, message from the report, and um, and then we can uh, uh, turn it over to others to jump in as well, is that transitions go through phases, and there are really promising solutions that are just in the emergence phase that uh, all of the, the, the private sector governments can enable those to really take, take hold and scale up. And so identifying those promising solutions and providing the finance, uh, providing incentives and, and even um, incentives for behavior change is important so that there can be an acceleration of uptake of those technology solutions that um, can, can really support the SDGs. But then the stabilization of those as well. And this, this is kind of links to the focus on immediate challenges versus long-term 
stabilization of, of sustainable solutions so that, uh, you know, it, when there are uh, new governments or new um, challenges to face that that these sustainable solutions don't kind of slip away. So finding ways to to really ensure their um, long term hold. Uh, so those are some of the key messages from the report, and I encourage you know everyone to take a look if they haven't. There are key message sheets. It's a it's a long report, so looking at the key messages can be helpful. Um, but you know hopefully this is a analytical product that can continue to support the approach that we're all taking here towards um, integration of the SDGs and, and cohesion across our work and um, supporting governments to do the same. And it's great to hear about the example from Mauritius of, of in practice um, how to do this. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Astra. Um, so colleagues, I know we're, we have like 10 minutes to go. I wanted to give all us uh, finalists a minute to, to come in. And then while you're doing that, uh, there's a question in the chat uh, that uh, that was put in, in terms of uh, uh, if there are any nimble networks that have different priorities, uh, your research policy practice. Uh, so this is coming from Priya. Um, for instance, I'm at the GEM report, which monitors SG4 but also has consistently monitored educational role in other SDGs for research outputs through synthesis data. Uh, if there's any part of that that you want to touch on uh, as part of that. Oh, Priya, I want to come in quickly uh, if, if I didn't cover your question properly. All good? Okay. All right, so colleagues, uh, if you can touch a little bit about uh, what are the perspective opportunities uh, going forward, uh, from your perspective, and then if you have any uh, response for Priya, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe we start with you, um, Sarai. I start from the. Thank you. <clears throat> so I, I'm just going to cover the next, the way forward in terms of the profession of a vision. Uh, I think this is what Sebastian was going to be presenting anyway, because we we are working very closely with the UNRCU and Sebastian and the team in Mauritius. So we have identified systems thinking, uh, future and systems thinking as um, the main methodology that we will use uh, going forward, not only in terms of SDG acceleration, but the whole preparation of the Vision 2054 Mauritius in terms of short, medium, and long-term planning. And um, we will be following the process, interviews, causal loop diagrams, the focus group sessions, and the analysis, so that we bring in all parties um, first separately and then together to discuss on our priority areas. Systems thinking, uh, I think, is the one that is most adapted to countries like Mauritius facing multiple challenges on different fronts, but also which have, has a lot of opportunities. Our economic structure is quite different. And uh, we have been discussing with the UN team as well as other partners. And uh, we are we are, we are working towards a staggered approach, I would say. The very first phase in terms of the elaboration of the plan or the vision is about planning the plan. So the very first step is about disseminating information to a wider audience in Mauritius of the approach that we are going to use to get them more comfortable, We're talking about civil society, the government. The UN has already started working with different ministries about this one. There was a workshop that they organized even before the creation of both strategies. So there was a work which was already being done and that you, which we want to accelerate. After that, we want to train the trainers to get people locally to understand, but not only to understand, but also to make other people understand what it involves. So that when we are actually drafting the vision 2054 Mauritius, which of course will rely heavily on the SDGs, um, we want, to, we want them to know what they are looking at so that we have meaningful, smart, actionable um, measures or policy directions. And uh, this is an ongoing collaboration. Um, actually, even um, this Friday, we have a very first uh, preliminary workshop to start dra uh, drawing the causal loop diagram and identify priority areas. And uh, it's going to be a constant in our whole process of research and consultations that was the creation of uh, or the crafting of Vision 2054 Mauritius. Thank you. Thank you, Sarai. Uh, Dan. 
Thank you, Baba Tunde. Um, I'll be brief. I actually wanted to um uh, to start um close to where um the the last point that was um that was made um um as it relates to the um the the global report and that is the importance of of noting um that transitions go through phases um and that within within that transition that there are promising solutions that that we can identify and I I kind of wonder I think position my my last points within the context of that last comment that came in regarding the report. Um, so following the um the action weekend for the the spotlight initiative, um, along with UNFP and the other agencies who are implementing the initiative, the aim is now to expand. Um, it's currently being implemented in 25 countries. So to expand that to cover 60 countries. Um, and what that looks like, um, it's not just looking at countries who are um, the, the classical development type countries, but also including high income countries and crisis contexts as well. Um, there's also um, intention of strengthening the, the role of this model of spotlight, um, really looking at how we localize this, the sustainable development goals. And um, what do I mean by that is further building on the experience that we have um, through the Spotlight Initiative in terms of strengthening institutions and civic space, but also showcasing a model that, that truly places women and girls at the heart of development and, and doing that in a way that is sustainable. Um, and it also means um, better connecting um, the prevention of violence against women and girls with the uh, the climate change response as well. So that is part of the, the, the efforts that Spotlight will be doing going forward. In addition to that, um, because civil society engagement is a critical part of the model, it's also continuing to partner with civil society organizations to do development differently, as it were, which means, um, in essence, placing communities at the heart of the response and removing barriers to critical funding and centering local knowledge and expertise as well. So there are five um, core areas that we'll be working on in terms of investing our efforts. One is on mobilizing the UN system and the global institutions on ending violence against um, women and girls, um, and doing that through the um, the, the SG's report, um, uh, looking at the, the call for these emergency response plans on, on, on gender-based violence. The second is around developing, um, is strengthening and, and uh, working better in terms of collaboration and, and centering around civil society, um, uh, different reference groups that we have within the network of working through Spotlight and civil society reference group is one of those and other instruments as well. Also, I spoke about the, the gap in, um, in funding. So it's looking at how we better mobilize resources towards replenishing the Spotlight Initiative Fund and also establishing a technical assistance hub um, that will again support governments to adopt the model. As I said, we're aiming to increase the 60 countries, but also to better support the implementation of our common agenda as well. And the final is on developing a global campaign, which um, seeks to um, look at eliminating social norms um, that really um, contributes to gender inequality, but also to um, expanding violence against women and girls as well. So I'll stop there, Baba Tunde, um, just trying to give those very concrete actions that the Secretariat of the Spotlight Initiative has agreed to work on moving forward. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, Jean Francois? Yes, thank you very quickly. Uh, I just wanted first to react on uh, um what astra um said and 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 I, I which i fully subscribe to and 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 in that sense i have a and, and unfortunately uh nenad has left but uh i have a slightly different perspective on on the issue at stake uh, i think most governments understand what policy integration means and and the potential you know for for acceleration in that uh, in that uh, uh, regard um, and, and, and at large, I would say the UN, the UN country teams also have a very good sense. What is really missing still, uh, especially when we look at uh, the potential multiplier's effect of, of combined investments in employment and social protections, for instance, is really, uh, really expanding the expanding the evidence. Really, as you said, Astra, to uh, help and support government in informed. Uh, uh, decision making and policy and policy making if you look at for instance the at the macro level you know the nexus between employment social protection and and uh, its its impact on on growth trajectories i think there is a lot that can be done there and we're actually now also launching a new tool on 
a structural model for sustainable development, which will which will really be key to engage into this policy dialogue uh, with the government, but also with financial institutions, because it's part of the global accelerator. Uh, IFIs and, and uh, MDBs are key partners and that are engaged as part of the, the development of the national roadmap. So this is also about fostering that policy dialogue through new evidence. And this is now my last point. This is very much for us the way forward in terms of strengthening and, and uh, investing in more research, in more uh, uh, knowledge development and also finalizing our m and &E system. Uh, you can check on our website. So we are uh, also expanding now uh, our work in uh, uh, more than 16 countries. We will. Uh, we are targeting reaching 30 uh, pathfinder countries by end of next year, uh, and uh, also launching the the new um, joint SDG fund window on uh, the on uh, decent jobs and universal social protection, which will support these efforts. But obviously, uh, our resource mobilization targets are, are much more ambitious, also from different other funding uh, streams. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean Francois. Uh, Jose. Yes, thank you, I'll try to be very, very brief. Just to to uh, echo and agree fully also with these challenges that Jean Francois was mentioning now, and that has been I think mentioned also throughout. That the real challenge is to put it in practice. No, this this um, uh, systems approach or or this uh, uh, this policy integration, uh, and the evidence is is a, is a key part of it, but also. I would add uh, mechanisms for collaboration because this is one one key uh, point that we um, uh, very often consider as a given or or as something that is just putting people in the same room. But uh, we really need the uh, tools and and work in in multi stakeholder uh, mechanisms to to for collaboration uh, uh, and and then coordination. So just uh, just uh, uh, related to that also. Uh, I, I will put some other tools that we are and or that we have developed, not just FAO, but especially with other uh, UN agencies and with other partners uh, for this. Uh, but also, I, I wanted to highlight one that we are developing now that is a really interesting project uh, that we are doing with the uh, Food Systems Coordination Hub, together with the food, UN Food Systems uh, Task Force, uh, and also uh, in connection with, with colleagues in DCO. Uh, that is a, a toolkit for for resident coordinators and their teams on how to imp to to apply a food systems approach uh, to to the work on accompanying countries in their food systems transformation journeys as they are going. We have already 120 plus countries that have a strategy for food system transformations. Of course, not all will be implementing them, but a lot are already uh, starting to to implement and to see how. Uh, to do that, so uh, RCs and and uh, and uh, UN cities have been really at the forefront in in supporting them uh, uh, in this. But uh, we are developing this toolkit also to to support them in in how how do we move from the theory to the to the practice? No, how 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 do we do that with the with the actual tools that uh, or or policy instruments that the countries have, but also the the policy instruments that we have as UN system, like how to integrate it in the UN CDA, CAF, etc. So uh, we will, we will, and I think this this network can actually be a, a very good uh, ally in that process of co-creation that we are starting now. And uh, eventually, we can have a discussion about okay, how to present uh, a first version of that uh, toolkit uh, uh, to all of you and to get feedback. And uh, that that would be a uh, that would be a great uh, possibility. Uh, then, just to close, uh, I think that uh, what we would like to see also is. Uh, uh, at least from a UN uh, perspective, is how these practical integrated approaches are also um, uh, reflected in, in, in global and national uh, policy instruments of the UN. So like, for example, agri-food system transformation, how it is reflected from the QCPR to the uh, UN CDSF uh, at, at country level, because it's it's uh, important to be supporting uh, the the member states in in integrating their own policies in 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 uh, uh, supporting their their processes. But also, I think it's important that we walk the talk and and we uh, also include those approaches in our own uh, policy documents from the global level to the to the to the country level. So just uh, that uh, last point, and uh, thank you very much again for the discussion. I hope we can continue even offline. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jose. Uh, lastly, Astra. Do you have anything to add before I close? Thanks, Babatunde. I don't. I don't, really don't have much to add, and I know that um, colleagues have other things to to run to. But just to say that this is really um, 
been a, 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 a good discussion, a good experience. And looking, looking ahead, um, you know, we're, first of all, looking toward the GSDR 2027. And I think um, having even more outreach to tackle how this integrated approach um, can be operationalized at a practical and country level will be um, something that the, the next group of scientists might be interested in focusing on. Um, they'll be coming together early 2024 to start their work. So we'll definitely um, be reaching out and, and keeping these connections to see how we can, um, I guess, bring the most pertinent questions to the scientists so that the report can, can continue to carry forward, um, you know, some of this analysis that's useful in, in practical terms for the SDGs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Astra. Um, on behalf of the IPPN organizing team, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Sanrai, for staying late, and many of the colleagues that are either in Asia or in Africa that is already evening. And uh, we, there's a lot that we need to do uh, to you know, get the SDGs back on track. There's integrated approaches that are needed. And I think we'll continue that conversation. And uh, happy Thanksgiving to colleagues that are in the US. Uh, see you again soon. And uh, there's a lot of information in the chat for you. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, Serge and uh, Nadine, uh, thanks for organizing. And Jessica, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.